let's start off with the geopolitical context because it's been two years since Russia invaded Ukraine. And as we know, that war is still ongoing. How would you characterize the impact that that's had on the global grain market and the movement of those grains around the globe? Well, first, thanks for having me on, Katie. And it's really been a, a really crazy few years here. And maybe to set the stage, when uh, before uh, 2 22 when the uh, Ukraine was invaded, um, we had a pretty tight global situation already in grain markets because the Chinese were aggressively restocking their food supplies, and we didn't have robust production in South America and here in North America. And then when the war broke out, things really kind of erupted and prices took off quite a bit at that time. So things have changed quite a, again here just in the last couple of years. Uh, this past year now with more uh, strong production out of the U.S. and in South America, Brazil and Argentina, and now even Ukraine ports have opened to get some exports back out again. And it's interesting, of course, when it comes to Ukraine, we've really seen a lot of unrest in other parts of the world. We opened up, of course, with farmers protesting in front of the EU headquarters. But when you think about the past two years and what's going on, particularly in Europe and that part of the world, what has the impact been for U.S. farmers in particular? Well, U.S. farmers really uh, benefited from some strong production in 22 and 23 and also high prices. So the uh, you know balance sheets of our U.S. farmers are very strong, but prices have really uh, declined quite a bit here of late in the last few months as we've restocked the global food supplies. The industry challenge, though, Katie, is really a supply and demand shipping challenge right now. As you know, we had been working about the Black Sea issues coming out of Ukraine which we've uh, started to see Ukraine ship at higher levels and had a very good month of exports in December. Uh, but now we have the Red Sea challenges with the Houthi rebels mm. attacking ships in that region, and thus people either going around the Suez Canal altogether, as well as we have on the Panama Canal, a drought in Panama, so we're having lesser shipments through the Panama Canal. So we have a kind of a shipping uh, challenge around the globe today as far as exports. Absolutely. Yeah. Whether it's uh, geopolitical in nature, whether it's the weather, it feels like the supply chain, it can never truly uh, you know, get organized there. But you mentioned supply and demand. And I want to talk about some of those dynamics when it comes to corn, because we know that U.S. farmers, they just harvested a record crop, truly astonishing, but they don't want to sell because of the prices. How do you trade around that? Yeah. And for us, you know, we're, we're a ethanol producer, so our big buyer of corn here in the United States. And what the Andersons does, we supply North American customers, whether it's food, feed or fuel. So for the cattle feeders, poultry processors, uh, you know, other types of livestock, swine, et cetera, um, that business goes on real regularly. So the domestic flow of grains is still really steady in the United States. And we're very active in that. U.S. trade balance on exports has declined on corn, with really the Brazilians taking a big sh uh, share of that market now. And when it comes to the U.S. farmers, though, I mean, what do you think will finally be the catalyst for them to start to sell meaningfully? Is that getting to a certain price on corn, or is it some other factor? Yeah, I mean, we've seen quite of a reset in prices here in the last couple of months. And, and, you know, farmers at the time of harvest were seeing good crops. They'll store on farm what they can, but they're going to need to come to market with some grains, unfortunately, at lower levels that they have benefited from the last two years. So I think it's kind of inevitable that we'll see some selling uh, in 2024. Um, but the good news is farmers have very strong balance sheets after two years of you know really strong income. Well, I want to talk a little bit about prices right now because corn, it's hovering around $4 or so a bushel. How much lower could it reasonably go at this point? Yeah, it's really hard to tell. I think the key thing is the U.S. production is, you know, in the bin now. Um, and we're looking at South American weather. We're getting ready now to plant the, what we call the safrinha crop, which is the second crop in Brazil. Uh, weather looks to be okay there right now. A year ago, it was quite dry. So I think that's a big thing the market is looking for. Uh, now, there also is record shorts. So a lot of the speculative positions are very big on the short side of the market. If that was ever to cover, you usually get some kind of bounce with that.
All right, yeah, so a few different dynamics going on there. But I want to talk about your plans specifically, because you told Bloomberg News last week that you're looking to buy ethanol plants, uh, really, that convert into green jet fuel. We've just been talking about Berkshire Hathaway and the record amount of cash they had. You said that, of course, the Andersons has plenty of dry powder. But what does the opportunity set look like? Are you running into the same sort of issue where there just isn't enough to buy out there? I think the last couple of years in our ag supply chain, we look at the fertilizer, grain, and in the uh, ethanol business, things were a little bit higher priced uh, with multiples, with lots available uh, cash available for people to invest in those kind of things. I think with higher interest rates, it feels like that is changing somewhat. In our position, we have three really strong ethanol plants in the eastern grain belt. We have the, the benefit of being able to have the geology there where we can sequester carbon at the site or nearby. And we have a very great partner in our business in Marathon Petroleum. So we're excited to position ourselves to have very strong ethanol plants that are able to have low CI scores that then could supply a potentially growing uh, sustainable aviation fuel market. That's where we'd like to position ourselves. And Pat, I'm curious, who are you competing against when it comes to these targets? And how has that competitive landscape changed? Well, I don't know if there's been such an active market uh, for people buying uh, ethanol plants. It's, it's a big industry. Uh, there's over 200 plants around the United States with you know many competitors. Uh, many of those are farmer cooperatives and a few other, uh, there's only a few public companies in that space. So I think what we're looking to as an industry right now is to continue to get higher levels of inclusion in gasoline and E15 uh, models, what we'd like to see, as well as position ourselves for an ethanol to jet market in the future. And Pat, just before I let you go really quickly, I am curious, when it comes to the fertilizer market specifically in the U.S. and Canada, how are you thinking about 2024? Yeah, things have uh, a little bit different than the grain markets. The fertilizer markets have softened some, but they're still pretty stable. Uh, our supplies in North America come mostly from Canada, some up from Florida, and not a lot coming from uh, the, you know, Russia and, and parts of the Eastern Europe. But we have a more stable market. I think farmers still are going to be encouraged, even with a little bit lower prices, to really fertilize strongly to get that production that they need.